You're watching Book TV. Next, Rachel Maddow talks about the U.S. embrace of perpetual war as a way of life and looks at how our views of war and the business of war has changed since Vietnam. This is about an hour and 15 minutes. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lynn Pascarella. I'm president of Mount Holyoke College. It is my honor to welcome you to our campus for what I know will be an engaging evening. Rachel Maddow is known to all of us as the host of The Rachel Maddow Show, the critically acclaimed MSNBC program where Rachel takes on issues at the forefront of public discussion and private debate every day. She is an author, a scholar, and one of the finest examples I know of Matt Holyoke's mission of using liberal learning for purposeful engagement in the world. <laughs> Mount Holyoke has been educating women for 175 years, and I am so, so proud to have such an extraordinary role model on our campus this evening. Before we get to Rachel's presentation, I want to introduce my dear friend Joan Grenier from the Odyssey Bookshop. Uh, without whom this event would not be possible. So, Joan. Hello, everyone. What a great night. First of all, I want to say, happy birthday, Cesar Chavez. He would be 85 years old. He would be 85 years old today, and he was very important in my political development. The Odyssey Bookshop is honored to be co-sponsoring this event with Mount Holyoke College, the Five College Women's Studies Research Center, and the Gender Studies Department. This year, okay, let's give them all a clap. This fall, the Odyssey Bookshop will be celebrating our 49th anniversary. And since you're such a captive audience, I have to tell you about some of our programs. Our first edition club has over 255 members around the country and uh, several international members. We have an incredible selection committee at the Odyssey. They have an amazing record of choosing books that go on to win major prizes, including the recent selections Tiger, Tiger's Wife by Taya Obrick, which won the Orange Prize, and Open City by Teju Cole, which won the Hemingway Pen award. So once a month you would get a signed first edition. It's a great graduation present. It's a great Mother's Day present. It's a, just a great year-round present. We also have a gift of reading program. And this is fantastic for grandparents or aunts and uncles. And oh, John and I are grandparents of three girls now. Our children's book buyer will hand pick a book each month for your child. There are four different age groups spanning ages 2 to 18. The books are gift wrapped, and it's just, it's just so much fun. I want you all to visit our website. We just uh, have a new website, and now you can purchase ebooks from us at odysseybks.com for any device except a Kindle. Uh, Amazon is proprietary about that. So your iPads, your tablets, your iPhones, your Android smartphones, your Nooks, your Sony readers, your laptops, your desktop computers, it's all, uh, you can do it very easily. So now we are a full service bricks and clicks bookstore. <laughs> yeah, I kind of like that too. Uh, new books, sale books, e-books, and, and over the next few months we will be greatly expanding our used book department. Lots of options for you to support your locally owned independent bookshop. We host over 120, <laughs> yay, thanks. We host over 125 events a year, and I want to tell you about a couple. Um, Carol DeSanti will be with us on Thursday, April 5th at 7 p.m. She's a Viking Penguin editor known for championing, championing independent original women's writing, and her new book is The Unruly Passion of Eugene R. I didn't say that. It's, it's French, so I can't do that too well. <laughs> Um, the book is set in Bordello's sal salons and streets of 19th century Paris, a different time from what Rachel will be talking about tonight, a different war, 
but surprisingly resonant with the issues swirling around us today, especially with regard to women. And we are uh, delighted to be co-sponsoring that event with the Five College Women's Studies Research Center. <laughs> And an incredible reception will follow that at the center with desserts to die for. On April 10th, we are hosting a launch for Mount Holyoke professor, dean of faculty, and author Christopher Bemphy. Chris will discuss his critically acclaimed new memoir, Red Brick, Black Mountain, White Clay, Reflections on Art, Family, and Survival. And that event is co-sponsored with the English department at Mount Holyoke. Quickly, quickly. Uh, on April 19th, Vijay Prashad will be with us for his new book, Arab Spring, Libyan Winter. And on the 24th, Michael Clare from Hampshire College, The Race for What's Left, The Global Scramble for the World's Last Research Resources. And finally, on Wednesday, April 25th, National Priorities Project, which is uh, an organization that we love dearly. Its, uh, its national headquarters is in Northampton, Massachusetts. Um, they're printing their first book, A People's Guide to the Federal Budget, and that will be at 7 o'clock. And um, we share a wonderful, yes, National Priorities Project. We share a wonderful staffer with, um, with National Priorities Project, and that's Sheila, who does uh, a lot of the uh, social media for both organizations. And finally, I do want to mention that Sarita Gunta, Mount Holyoke class of 96 and executive director of Jobs with Justice is speaking upstairs in the New York room on April 18th at 4.15. So um, I, I have quite a fondness for uh, Jobs with Justice. There's a wonderful local organizer um, called, uh, named John Weissman. Okay, I'm married to him. Um, <laughs> A little bit about the signing procedures. There's over 400 people who will be in line. And there's a dance in here at 11 o'clock. <laughs> so no inscriptions, no post photos. Uh, we'll be calling you up by the signing groups A, B, C, D, and um, moving it right along. So this is Rachel's second event of the day. And she's in Cambridge tomorrow. So we want to keep the line going. I really would like you to join me in giving the Odyssey staff a warm round of applause. They have been incredible. And now it is my pleasure to introduce another amazing woman, Karen Rimler, Professor of German Studies, Critical Social Thought and Gender Studies at Mount Holyoke College and Director of the Five College Women's Studies Research Center. Karen has worked tirelessly to bring us all together today to hear Rachel Maddow. Karen. Good evening. I also wanted to give generous thanks to Joan. It's through her dedication to this community, to South Hadley, to the Mount Holyoke community, that we have celebrated authors who come here every week. Thank you, Joan, and thank your staff. Yeah, thank you, staff. Mm -hmm. Many people work very hard to make this event happen, and I'd like to take just a minute to thank some people by name, and many of you know that we appreciate your work. I'd like to thank Elizabeth Lehman, who's the Assistant Director of the Five College Women's Studies Research Center, um, Bridget Barrett, the Senior Administrative Assistant, Gender Studies, Mount Holyoke College, Chris Bergbaum, who is working up there, thank you. All of these people and many more have coordinated people, space, technology to, to make it possible for you all to sit here comfortably in anticipation of Rachel Maddow. I'd also like to thank the staff of facilities management and the campus police for keeping the peace and for setting up. Thank you so much. Okay. And then finally, a heartfelt thanks to President Lynn Pascarella. She's very modest. She's also a frequent commentator on radio, as you know. So she's out there for us. Thank you. I have the privilege of directing the Five College Women's Studies Research Center, also celebrating an anniversary, 21 years. We are an international interdisciplinary center that supports the work of feminist scholars, activists, artists, and practitioners 
from around the world and here in the Pioneer Valley. In fact, as you know, the Pioneer Valley and the five colleges are probably the largest concentration of feminists in the world. Um, and I invite you, I'm not going to go through the whole list of events, but we have a table out in the lobby, and I invite you to pick up a flyer about some of our upcoming events in the next couple of weeks, and we are always open to the community, so I welcome all of you to join us. We are especially pleased to welcome Rachel Maddow this evening. The center is planning to launch a new initiative on women, the media, and the public sphere worldwide. And we are hoping to bring Rachel Maddow back at some point, along with other women who have worked tirelessly, rigorously around the world to bring the news to you and to comment about the politics of the day. And we hope many of you will, will jump into the fray and also become commentators in the public sphere, real, virtual, local, global. Okay. I have to say one word of organization. I know you're all waiting. Um, Rachel Maddow has generously agreed to answer questions. And again, she has been working tirelessly this week. She's been on David Letterman, on Terry Gross, on John Stewart. So she's very, very busy. So we have set it up to have four mics. We have two mics. We'll have two mics on either aisle, one way up at top where all our students are sitting. And then one on the second balcony. And I will mod moderate the question and answer. And we will take turns. We'll go one mic to the other. So be prepared to line up after Rachel speaks. Rachel Maddow is no stranger here. In fact, she's a lot of your neighbor. Um, a lot of you have her as her neighbor. She also started her first radio gig down the road in Holyoke, Massachusetts, as many of you know. And as President Pascarella mentioned, she is a brilliant scholar. She has a degree from Stanford University, Oxford University, She's a Rhodes Scholar and an Emmy Award-winning television host of her own show. I have read her book, Drift, The Unmooring of American Military Power, and I recommend it to you. I've been recommending it to everyone, including the Marines that I know. I think they'll, they actually confirm a lot of what's in the book so far. She argues that the military, the U.S. military, has become so private that many Americans stay out of the whole process of going to war altogether. She reminds us of unexpected connections, say, between the cost of daycare for toddlers of military parents and a bird called the Hubara Bostard hunted in Balochistan, Pakistan. She reminds us that this book took a lot of time, a lot of intensive research, much of which was available in the public record. So listen to what your elected officials have to say, read the documents, and also follow the money. Rachel herself on her blog said recently, the book is not about Democrats and Republicans, it's not about liberals and conservatives, and not even about good and bad guys. It is about America, as a great country that has forgotten one of the things that makes us great. And I think we can get back to what that was, and I would love it if we could at least have a big national talk about it. So Rachel Maddow is here to have, to continue that big national, and I would say international talk about it. So welcome, please, Rachel Maddow. You're embarrassing me. <laughs> Thank you. I have um, four hours and 45 minutes left of being 38. Oh.
Thank you very much. <laughs> like this wasn't embarrassing enough already. Um, I have never written a book before, um, and I don't think I'm ever going to write a book again. Um, and but the the what that means for tonight is that I don't know how to do this. Um, I don't know. Who knows how to do this, right? Is there a normal thing to do? I don't know. Um, what I'm planning on doing is reading a, a short thing, um, actually, that Karen was just talking about, about the Hubara Bustard, um, and then just briefly telling you a little bit about what the book is about, and then I will happily take um, your questions, and then at the end of the night, I will sign books. Are there any objections? <laughs> Hearing none? All right. Um, and I, 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 I will say uh, two things as a matter of, of preface. Um, one is that it's really nice that you guys have come out to see me. Um, you may know me from TV, I'm guessing most of you do, um, but whether or not you know me from TV, you know enough about this book to know that it's about the military and about poli the politics of war making in this country. And that is not your standard, like, Saturday night, let's go hang out kind of thing. <laughs> I realize this is not candy. You know, this isn't like, hey, I met some jerk who disagrees with me, and let me tell you how jerky he is. That can be more fun sometimes. And so this, um, just the fact that you're here and you would consider reading it and you're here to hear me talk about it is very heartening to me. Because you hear all over and over again that all anybody he wants is the easy stuff. And this is not the easy stuff, so thank you uh, for being here. The other thing I would say is um, before you leave, you should probably meet somebody here who you don't already know. Because if you all like me and you want to come out on a Saturday night and talk about the military, you probably like each other. <laughs> so if there are people here who you don't know, I don't mean to like set you up on dates or whatever, but. I'm just saying, this is probably a good place to make new friends, so we'll do like a peace be with you thing at the end of the homily. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> the Hubara Bustard um, is not a particularly large or regal bird. It looks a little like what you might get if you bred a common pheasant with an ostrich, like a, like a miniature ostrich with a shorter neck and legs. Or maybe it's like a, a pheasant on steroids with a stretched neck and sprinter's legs and a much more impressive wingspan. But the little fella, the Hubara Bustard, has recently provided crucial assistance in making America's war in Afghanistan and its spillover in Pakistan the longest running military hot show in our nation's history. In May 2011, Pakistan got its nose out of joint when U.S. Special Forces sprung a surprise mission on a compound in Abbottabad and off the most infamous terrorist on the planet without giving a heads up to the host government. The Pakistani military and intelligence service found itself having to explain how the target, Osama bin Laden, could have been living in tranquility just a few miles down the road from Pakistan's most important military academy in a neighborhood crawling with current and retired military officers. Was Pakistani intelligence that incompetent, or were they protecting bin Laden? And then they had to explain how a U.S. strike force and its very large helicopters could fly into Abbottabad, spend nearly an hour on the ground, and then leave the country with bin Laden's carcass in tow without being detected, let alone stopped. While President Obama and the rest of America took a celebratory victory lap, the Pakistanis found the entire episode hugely shaming. But not so much on the bin Laden in our backyard count. They really focused on the lack of respect accorded their own nation by the United States. Quote, American troops coming across the border and taking action in one of our towns is not acceptable to the people of Pakistan, said former President Pervez Musharraf the day after the raid. It is a violation of our sovereignty. The Pakistani parliament called the country's military and intelligence chieftains into a rare and marathon closed-door session where the generals did have a spot of trouble in covering their respective lapses, but they did deftly deflect much of the civilians' ire. The United States, they reminded everyone, was the real bad guy here. The generals had little trouble encouraging parliament to formally demand that henceforth the United States would ensure that Pakistan's national interests were fully respected. Ally, shmally. The Pakistani people deserve some respect. To add some bite to this declaration of sovereignty, the general suggested a good first step would be forcing the U.S. to shut down the secret program the CIA had been running out of an air base in a remote corner of Pakistan called Baluchistan. Unfortunately, in publicizing their demand that the CIA leave that air base, 
the generals also revealed to surprised Pakistani legislators that the CIA had been using that airbase. <laughs> this was cause for an uproar in parliament. But the fact that the CIA had been flying armed drones out of the airfield known as Shamsi came as much less of a surprise to the citizens of the areas those drones were targeting, the tribal regions. The CIA's rather dumpy looking, high tech, unmanned aircraft had been used mainly for surveillance in the early stages of the war in Afghanistan, but they could also be armed with Hellfire missiles. Very occasionally, from 2004 to 2007, and more frequently in 2008, the George W. Bush administration had used drones to launch airborne attacks on suspected terrorists in Pakistan. When the Obama administration took over in 2009, the number of drone attacks spiked. The next year, the 2009 numbers more than doubled. The Obama administration refused as a matter of policy to officially acknowledge the CIA's drone attacks, but in the days following a big get, they announced that some key Al-Qaeda or Haqqani network leader was killed, as if the event were an act of providence or, like a rainbow, a remarkable atmospheric happening. <laughs> These drone attacks had become the centerpiece of Obama's recalibration of America's global war on terror, even if we didn't call it that anymore. The Obama administration had no intention of pulling up stakes in Shamsi. Quote, that base is neither vacated nor being vacated, was the anonymous but official word from Washington. It was a Mexican standoff in Baluchistan. Here's rather Hubara Bustard provided a little wiggle room in what was otherwise sort of a naughty situation. Naughty with a K, not naughty with a G. <laughs> <laughs> you forget about, you know, <laughs> You forget about um, homonyms <laughs> when you're reading out loud. Well, that's weird. Anyway, um, this tiny forgotten strip of land that held the airbase in Shamsi, it turned out it did not actually belong to Pakistan. It had been quietly signed over to the United Arab Emirates 20 years earlier in a, in a sign of friendship between the two countries. You see, Baluchistan, aside from being full of spectacular Garden of Eden natural wonders, and it is supposed to be among the most beautiful places on earth. Aside from that though, Baluchistan is among the few wintering grounds of the Hubara Bustard. And the Hubara Bustard is a bird held in high esteem among hunters from the United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia and Qatar. Falconry is, of course, the sport of Arab kings. And the poor Bustard had long been the preferred prey for falconers. So Emirati royalty were frankly really pleased to have this special foothold in Baluchistan. And right away they built themselves a sizable landing strip so they could get easy access to the surprisingly sought after remote corner of the world. Quote, the sheiks tell me it is the ultimate challenge for the falcon. A chieftain in Baluchistan told the writer for the New Yorker named Marianne Weaver back around the time that the Emiratis built that Shamsi airstrip. Quote, the falcon is the fastest bird on earth and the hubara bustard is also fast, both on the ground and in the air. It also is a clever, wary bird with a number of tricks. Among these tricks, this is my single favorite part of the book. It's really gross. <laughs> Among these tricks, the chieftain continued, is an ability to inkjet a dark green slime violently from its vent. You know what the vent is on a bird, right? to inkjet a dark green slime violently from its vent. Its force is so strong that it can spread for three feet and it can temporarily blind the falcon or glue the falcon's feathers together, making it unable to fly. You now don't have to buy the book because that's the best thing in it. The belief also persisted that the meat of the Hubara Bustard was an aphrodisiac. Not hard to see why the Bustard had been sought and consumed with such sustained effort that the bird was nearly extinct on the Arabian Peninsula. 
Cold War politics had added degrees of difficulty for the sportsmen as well. The fall of the Shah in 1979 made bustard hunting problematic for Sunni Arabs in Shiite Iran, as had the near constant state of war in Afghanistan. So Baluchistan emerged as the destination spot for latter-day Arab Nimrods. For the last 20 years or so, Emirati sheiks and Saudi princes and the more general run of ambitious Arab dignitaries had jockeyed for the best allotments in the last good place on earth to hunt this poor bustard. When Pakistan's foreign office bestowed upon the Emiratis an allotment that was once held by the Saudis, the Saudis withheld oil supplies from Pakistan and money for flood relief in retaliation. Arab royalty of various stripes show up every year with, according to Weaver's description, pop-up tent cities, hundreds of servants, satellite dishes for better communication, and hunting vehicles tricked out with sophisticated laptops, infrared spotlights, and bustard-seeking radar. <laughs> Maybe not sporting, but certainly effective. I'm almost done. The Emiratis had made one concession that did slightly crimp their style in the bustard hunting department. In the weeks after the 9-11 attacks in 2001, when everybody wanted to pitch in, they had agreed with the consent of Pakistani President Musharraf to let the Americans use Shamsi as a base to supply US troops fighting the Taliban just across the border in Afghanistan, and also maybe for a few special and classified operations. In the 10 years that followed, as the CIA and its many private contractors began operating lethal attack drones out of Shamsi, the remote top secret base remained off limits to Pakistan's own air force. So when the bleep hit the fan, when the slime hit the falcon, <laughs> in the aftermath of the bin Laden raid, thanks to the Hubara bustard, everybody had an out. The United States could make it plain that the CIA was not vacating Shamsi, and Pakistan could still save face. Pakistani government officials could say, and they did, hey, we just checked our land records, and it turns out this little strip of Balochistan is not legally speaking Pakistan-controlled territory after all. We gave it to the Emiratis for bustard hunting. So sorry, but there's nothing we can do to stop this part of America's secret drone war operating out of Shamsi. But we do condemn it in the strongest possible language. The United Arab Emirates, meanwhile, went on record saying they had only built the airstrip. Emirati sheiks and others used it for, they said, recreational purposes. What recreation the CIA was pursuing there, the Emiratis couldn't say. <laughs> Shamsi, they assured the world, was never operated or controlled by the United Arab Emirates. And so, we still had our drone base in Shamsi, and no skittish ally had to take the blame for having handed, over, handed it over to us. <clears throat> so that's a little bit of how the book goes. That is the best part. <laughs> Just not the whole section, but like that part about the slime, <laughs> I think is the best. Um, I am not an expert on the military. I am not an expert on war. Uh, my gig is politics, uh, and that's what I have pursued as an activist and what I studied as an academic and what I bloviate about on television. Um, and this book is a book about politics. It is about the politics of going to war and the politics of not going to war and the politics of ending wars that we are in. The consternation over the Vietnam War led to a multi-front effort to make sure that we did not end up in a mess like that again. Uh, the Congress passed a War Powers Act, which reasserted that presidents can't just take us into big wars on their own say-so. Congress having sole constitutional authority to declare war means that they've got to not just be told, but be asked about war. Congress is the body that gets to decide. Congress, aside from the War Powers Act, also after Vietnam, got up on its hind legs, as they say, actually as only I say, um, <laughs> and exerted a sim simply a more muscular attitude toward matters of national security. Gerald Ford wanted to essentially re-engage with Vietnam after we had left in a way that many members of Congress believed would get us started into that war again. And Congress stopped him from doing it. He was set on doing it. He thought it was the right thing to do for the country. And Congress, members of Congress, Democrat and Republican said no. 
and when he and the con Congress had a very, very serious confrontation over it, one that horrified Gerald Ford. He thought that Congress was way overstepping his bounds. They went so far as to tell him that they would use the appropriations process. They would withhold dollars to stop him from doing what he wanted to do. The powers of the presidency, I think, were confronted, even if they weren't changed, by that newly muscular attitude from Congress, but it is a balance. And that was a time when Congress flexed its muscles. But maybe I think the most interesting change that Vietnam brought us, that doesn't get as much attention in civilian life, because we don't feel like it's our business, really, um, was the Abrams Doctrine. Uh, Creighton Abrams was head of the Army. Uh, as the Vietnam War was winding down, and he died very shortly after the end of the war. But before he died, he worked on something called the total force policy, which usually gets shorthanded as the Abrams Doctrine. And the idea was that the military would be restructured so we couldn't go to war in big ways without disrupting civilian life, specifically without calling up the Guard and Reserves. When LBJ was trying to make a decision about escalating in Vietnam, he knew that he didn't want to make the argument to the country about why that was smart to do. He had been making the argument as a politician for years that it was not smart to escalate in Vietnam. LBJ would talk about not wanting to send American boys thousands of miles around the world to do what Asian boys ought to be doing for themselves. He was not in favor of it. He didn't want to make the political argument for it, and yet he felt like he had to do it. So LBJ's solution was, oh, we'll expand the draft. Nobody will notice that. <laughs> we had had a draft constantly at that point in our, in, in our country for decades. Um, bless you. But the, what, he, what he avoided, what he didn't do, because he didn't want to upset the country too much, is that he didn't call up the Guard and Reserves. He thought, ah, there's all these people who are pretty well-connected, who have well-connected parents, at least, who are in the Guard and Reserves. And I don't want to go calling up the Guard and Reserves if I'm going to have to hear from all these well-connected constituents about this war that I don't really want to defend. So we'll do the draft. That'll keep it quiet. And not very many, compared to modern conflicts, certainly not very many guardsmen and reservists ended up serving on the ground in Vietnam. The draft was used to expand the people, uh, expand the number of people we had there instead. But when Abrams got a hold of this idea of restructuring the military, he said, you know what, guard and reserves are going to have to do. We are going to operationally structure the army so that you can't have a big military operation of any kind without having guardsmen and reservists there. And why? So that civilian life would be disrupted by the fact that we were in war and that there would not be a divide between civilian life and military life that had so crippled the country, I think emotionally and politically and cathartically, um, at, the end of, at the end of Vietnam. Um, and I think that was important to the politics of war. It would keep the country focused on and feeling the sacrifice that war entailed. It wouldn't be the military off alone doing its own thing. Uh, Ronald Reagan's presidency changed a lot of that. Um, he started a war in Grenada with Congress barely knowing about it. When Congress said no to what he wanted to do in Central America, he secretly went around them to do it anyway, just flagrantly breaking the law. When he got caught and his administration was trying to save his presidency, they invented a brand new radically expanded doctrine of presidential power that essentially said that a president alone as one person can direct any war-related action anywhere on earth, even in direct contradiction of a law passed by Congress, which is bizarre. And that bizarre idea, which I really do think was simply cooked up on the spot to save Reagan's butt at the end of Iran-Contra, um, that became the basis of the political life of a obscure Wyoming congressman named uh, Dick Cheney. <laughs> and that became unexpectedly important. Um, years later, when Congress's previous muscularity on issues of war and not war actually went all flabby. Uh, and then Dick Cheney as White House Chief of Staff and then later as Defense Secretary, uh, he came up with something that was essentially the cure to the Abrams Doctrine. Instead of making sure that the manpower needs of the military engaged the whole country whenever we went to war, he restructured the thing so that the manpower needs of the military would be met as quietly as possible, with as little civilian upset as possible. It would, those manpower needs would be met in part for profit, privately. Uh, the Clinton-Gore administration uh, was delighted to embrace and expand on that Cheney project. It made it much easier for them, for example, when they needed to get around their own political constraints to use force in the Balkans. And so this book is not about the merits of any individual war. The Congress waxes and wanes. 
in its interest in constraining and overseeing and directing matters of war, even though the Constitution does put them in charge of it. The President's new expanded powers that treat the U.S. military essentially as one man's personal army, those powers have grown and grown. The military itself has become more and more hived off, cleaved from civilian life. The national security budget keeps growing and becoming more and more impenetrable. More and more gets declared secret. The politics get more and more muted. The wars get longer and longer. And our sense that something is wrong gets deeper. I, I, I feel both for the guy who's putting the magnetic yellow ribbon on the back of his SUV and the person you know, in the bike lane next to them cursing that dumb magnetic yellow ribbon on the back of your SUV, that's self-defeating and impotent. I feel for both of those things because I actually think they come from the same place. They come from a sense that we are a country that has not gone to war. We sent a military to war and they went without us. And I think that people feel that on the left and on the right, and I think people feel that who have no politics at all. We barely noticed when the Iraq war ended. After eight and a half years, more than 4,000 Americans killed, even if you only care about the Americans killed and not the Iraqis killed. After all of that time, when it ended, when did it end? December. It was a ho-hum shrug from the civilian population. I mean, St. Louis threw a parade, but New York didn't. These are changes that I think have happened over a relatively short period of time. I do not think there was a conspiracy here, although I love hearing conspiracy theories because I find them very entertaining. <laughs> I think essentially we had a series of understandable decisions made by people looking at short-term political necessity. I see something that I think we ought to do for national security purposes, but the price tag is going to sound way too high for people. Let's tell them it's free. Let's give them a tax cut, tell them it's free, and hope that they don't notice when their grandkids have to pay for it. I want to deploy a large number of Americans, but I don't really want to have to answer for how many Americans I am deploying. Let's have some of them be working for private companies, because then we, not only do we not have to answer for how much we're paying them, we don't have to answer for what the lines of accountability are when they do something wrong, and if they die or get hurt, nobody will ever know. I think I want to do something for national security, but the Congress has passed a law against it. I'm going to assert that I am above that law. I'd like to wage a war in, I don't know, say Pakistan. But I don't want to get around the political constraints that are between me and a war in Pakistan. So I will wage one in secret and not answer when asked about it. I don't think all of those decisions happened all at once. I think they happened over a relatively short period of time, though. And I think it was all about trying to get around these annoying constraints keeping us from waging wars we wanted to wage, and, 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 and keeping us from, from using the military in ways that we wanted to use it. And those annoying constraints are some of the best things we inherited from the Founding Fathers. Those annoying constraints are there for a reason. The Constitution is structured to put 535 squabbling members of Congress in charge of whether or not to declare war, because a squabble among 535 members of Congress about something that important is due to be loud and take a long time and be a pain, and it will engage us all, and that was the point. If they wanted it to be easy to go to war, they would have given war-making power to the President, and they emphatically did not. And they talked about it at the time, and we can read their letters about it. So again, this is, this is not about the merits of any one war. I think we have cut away from the mooring that we got from our Constitution to make us not too warlike as a country. Not to make us a pacifist country, and I'm not a pacifist, and I, I know that I, I have a lot of respect for pacifism as a way of life and a way of thinking about these things. It's not my point of view. I believe that sometimes wars are necessary. I want us to have an excellent military. But I do believe that the Constitution structured us to be a deliberately peaceable nation where peacetime is our default and war is the aberration, and that's been flipped. <laughs> and it turns out there's this bustard that slimes falcons and makes their feathers stick together so they crash. And it turns out that if you leave nuclear weapons sitting around for too long, they grow fungus. Um, so, there, you know, <laughs> there's, I really enjoyed uh, writing this. I hate writing, but I liked writing this, and it came out the way I meant it to. And I'm grateful that you are here and would consider uh, reading it, because I'd love for us to have a big national fight about this stuff. I think it can all be fixed. Thank you very much for being here.
No, no, you can stand there. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay. Yeah, we didn't rehearse this, so we're not sure where we're standing, but we both have mics. Dance. Okay. Contra dance. Okay, we have time for a few questions. And as I said previously, we're going to start up in the balcony, and I already see someone standing ready to go. Go ahead and ask your... Um, so I actually have a question about the parade for the vets that was in St. Louis. I was wondering both if you've seen any movement towards having a New York parade and if you think there's any, justi any legitimate justification for not having that parade until all the vets come home. Excellent question. I totally think that there are two legitimate sides to the debate. I don't think that, um, I, I am inclined to think that we ought to, we ought to do it, that we ought to mark the end of the Iraq war in a way that would let civilians say thank you to veterans, welcome them home, and to acknowledge that this thing that they did has been concluded. Um, the Pentagon's line on it um, is understandable. And their line on it is, listen, you know, the Iraq and Afghanistan wars are separate political entities, but the same people have been fighting both of these wars. And we've got 90,000 Americans deployed right now in Afghanistan. And so to welcome them home from Iraq is essentially welcoming home, them home from a political entity when a lot of them are not physically actually home. Um, and I absolutely, I, I have a lot of respect for that viewpoint. And I, a lot of people who I know who care about this issue as much as I do uh, adopt that as their position. I've just talked to a lot of Iraq and Afghanistan veterans who say, you know what? I've been in both places, I've been deployed in both places, and if I were in Afghanistan right now, knowing that there's been a parade at home to mark the end of the Iraq war would make me psyched to be able to come, think about coming home to do that for me when I'm home from Afghanistan too. So, you know, I, I, don't, think this is a, I don't think this is an issue where you're wrong if you're on one side or you're, or you're right if you're on the other. I would love to debate it. I think it's weird that the Pentagon wants there to be a, it says that they support there being parades in every other country, every other city in the country, but not in New York. Um, the, uh, Christine Quinn, who's the head of the city council in New York, and a few of the city councilors there still want to do it. Iraq and Afghanistan veterans of America support the idea. The Pentagon's advising against it, but they don't probably get the last word on this. So I think it's still sort of an open question. But thank you. So we have a question in the second balcony. This, this one? Yes. Okay. You uh, Rachel, I read and really enjoyed your book, but one of the premises of your book is the demise of the citizen soldier after Vietnam. And you discuss several reasons in Vietnam for that, but one you don't discuss is the fact that a significant portion of those civilian soldiers in Vietnam revolted, mutinied against their army, killed their soldiers, killed their officers when they resisted it. And this scared the shit out of the army. And ever since that incident, they have eliminated the civilian soldier. They have turned themselves into a professional army, army, so they never have to face that kind of revolt again. Could you comment on that and why it was never mentioned in your book? Sure. Um, I, th I think that that is, it's implicit when you talk to um, the military right now about this, uh, I think left and right fulmination among civilians that we ought to bring back the draft. A lot of people say, a lot of people have said to me about the book um, since it's come out, but I think people, whenever they talk about this issue broadly, talk about how we need to bring back the draft so that people are more connected to, uh, civilians are more connected to the threat of military service, so everybody has some skin in the game. And the reason that usually gets shut down doesn't go much further than that is because the military says absolutely not. The military has absolutely no interest in there being a draft. They don't want to be in an environment, whether it's a training environment or a combat environment, with people who don't want to be there. Now you're right, the last time that was true was in Vietnam. And ultimately, I think that the civilian soldier idea is broader than just the draft, is broader than just conscription. It is the idea that we are not a country that maintains a massive standing military force that we are looking to use all the time. I think that's, a, that's something that the Founding Fathers debated and we sort of decided something different than what we ended up with. The citizen soldier idea is that we have a peaceable economy and a peaceable country that is dislocated temporarily for the purpose of going to war and then we go back to normalcy. 
That hasn't been true for a very, very long time, but it's a very good question. Okay, down here, please. We have the question kneelers down here. Um, so I will confess I am a big nerd. I had your book overnighted to me and actually read it in advance of tonight. Um, Thank you. I know. Do you um, agree that the bustard part was the best part? The green slime, definitely. Green slime, see? Yeah, and I actually grew up 30, uh, 30 miles from the fungus-riddled wings of Barksdale Air Force Base. <laughs> so that uh, struck home as well. But anyway, what struck me as interesting, most interesting about the book was you talk a lot about the executive branch, you talk a lot about the, exec, uh, the legislative branch, and there's not a lot about the judiciary. And we've, over the past week, you know, witnessed the role of the judiciary in determining what is and what is not constitutional. And one of the premises of the book is that the executive has overstepped his constitutional authority to declare war. And I'm wondering why you see, don't think that there's been any role of the judiciary in this, to check that power. It's a to totally, totally good question. And it is because the judiciary has deferred to Congress. Because the judiciary looks at the division of powers in the Constitution and says, yeah, we know this isn't us. And we know it's not you. It's you guys. You guys are supposed to use your equal power as Congress to weigh in here and take that power back. And you know, you see that in one, one point of the book, there's this forgotten the history now, and it's weird because it's not that long ago, but members of Congress sued in court, in federal court, to stop George H.W. Bush from waging Gulf War I. This was my land to tis of thee chapter? My land to tis of thee, exactly which is all about, it's called My Land Statistics, because it's about George H.W. Bush feeling the weight of the world on his shoulders for having to make this decision about war as one man. And you just want to scream into the book, dude, it's not supposed to be you alone. <laughs> but, <laughs> but some members of Congress were yelling that at him and um, actually decided to seek federal, a federal court injunction to stop the war, right. which is a crazy idea. Um, and the ruling from the judge in the case is a beautiful thing. It is really beautifully articulated. I could have essentially just plagiarized it and made that the thesis statement of the book. But at the end of it, he says, and having concluded that you are right, and the president is doing stuff he's not supposed to be doing, and these are Congress's powers, dude, these are Congress's powers. I, as a judge, can't stop him from doing anything. You as Congress have the power to stop him. But it can't just be this dozen members of Congress, however many people it was, a small group, suing to do it. You actually have to take action as Congress, which means you have to act by majority vote within yourself as an institution to stop the president from doing this thing. Do your job. And it's, this, it's a bucket of cold water. Um, but it's, that's, it's true that, you know, I don't expect any president, no matter, you know, I mean, you could reincarnate Jesus and elect President Jesus, and maybe that would work. But aside from President Jesus, I don't expect that any president would give back power that the executive branch had accrued through the precedent of the actions of previous presidents. Nobody gives away power. If you're president, you think you've got the country's best interest at heart, and you're stymied all the time by other people in politics who don't want the best things for the country, you're not going to give away power to get something done if you believe that you're doing what's right and other people are stopping you. Pre presidents don't give power away. It's like a, an, an aged rubber band that only stretches one direction. <laughs> Congress has to take that power back. And Congress has to do it on their own behalf. And we don't have much faith in Congress to do anything right now. To do something that big maybe <laughs> seems like pie in the sky, but that's what needs to happen, I think. Okay. Thank you. Allie. <laughs> so first of all, it's just me to the mic. Hello. Sorry. I'm really tall. Sorry. <laughs> I'm, I'm here. I'm right here. There you can, go. You, can you hear me? Um, so first of all, thank you for coming out tonight. Um, my question has more to do with the nature of the war that we're talking about. In your book, you talk a lot about more um, formal wars or formal declaration of wars. So my question is, what does the role of this sort of more stateless era of war in counterterrorism have to do with the military's functioning, you know, whether that's um, a reclassification of combatants as illegal or reinterpretations of wartime powers, what does that have to do with how the military is functioning that's different from before? Excellent question and very hard to answer, <laughs> I will tell you. Um, I think that basically, that I think that there is um, reasonable wiggle room 
in terms of the way that we are set up as a country under the president's commander in chief powers to do some things in an almost unilateral or temporarily unilateral way when uh, speed is of the essence. When, um, I mean, the, the way the founders talked about it was to do things like repel invasion. Um, there are some things where I think the, the president is given authority to act as a military commander outside what we think of as the constitutional prerogatives of war making. It's limited. It's very limited powers. And to the extent that war making right now is about transnational groups that, that don't have governments that speak for them and that don't have borders that they respect, I think that those two things have worked together to radically expand the amount of military power we use without any deference to Congress whatsoever. For example, we do a lot of military, a lot of our military work now through the CIA. And the CIA is essentially functioning as another branch of the military. But they are one that has deniabil deniability, I guess, they think, um, in terms of when, whether we explain or own up to their actions. And I can see why somebody who wants the power to act in the nation's national security interests wants the flexibility to be act, able to act anywhere in the world in secret, deny they ever did it, never explain it, and cover it up if necessary. I just don't think that's America. I can understand why somebody wants that power, but we're not designed to give anybody that power, at least in a sustained way. So it's, I think it's put pressure on all the weak points of where we were already drifting anyway. Thank you. Thank you. Up in the balcony, top balcony. Good evening. Whoa. <laughs> Don't Good be evening. afraid. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here with us tonight. Uh, my question is, after the war in Vietnam, there was a very clear period of reflection and questioning, both on the part of the American public and American politicians, as to what are the lessons we learned from this war. And my question is, do you think that a similar period of reflection and questioning will come about after, in the aftermath of Iraq and Afghanistan, or are we too removed as a nation from our military actions for that to happen? That is the big $64,000 question. Um, that, uh, yeah, I was, when I was um, on The Daily Show this week, and that was John Stewart's question. He said, I see that all these things that you are implicitly praising after Vietnam happened after the national upheaval that was Vietnam. Do we need something that big again in order to assert, for example, Congress's power over these things, in order to make the kinds of changes that you say? And I, I think it's arguable. I mean, to have fought not only the longest war in American history, but alongside that, to have fought another eight and a half year long in Iraq, concurrent with the longest war in American history, and to have had only 1% of the population fighting those wars, and for them to be completely unpaid for, and for the civilian population to be continuously granting itself multi-trillion dollar tax cuts over the course of those wars, when you put all those things together, I think you are approaching um, unsustainable crisis, just in terms of how we think of ourselves as a country. Um, I, I am a big believer in, uh, in protest movements. I think that direct action gets the goods, and I think that the reason there were so many changes after Vietnam is because people were in the streets. Um, I, I don't foresee that happening on this issue now because we are inured to the fact that these wars are happening in our name because it feels like it's something separate because we don't even notice when Iraq ends. I don't foresee that kind of mass social movement. But we also have a situation in which there's no partisan affiliation in terms of how people feel about these things. How people feel about the Afghanistan war is completely disassociated from people's party position at this point. So that's pretty radical. Almost every controversial issue in American politics is bifurcated by party or at least by liberal and, liberal and conservative ideological lines. Not this. So, no, we don't have a mass social movement pushing for this. But if anybody does push on these issues, I think they will find that they are pushing on an open door. I don't think there is going to be as much resistance to these things as we think. So, to me, it feels fixable. I feel like the crisis that we are in is big enough 
the way that it is manifesting is with a national disgust rather than with a national protest movement, it's going to remain to be seen. I, I, actually, I do hope that this book can be part of naming the problem so we can talk about how to fix it. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Okay, middle balcony. Hi. Um, your show and the information on your show, the stories that you tell, and your book are so well-researched. And I'm just kind of curious how you ensure that the facts are facts. Um, through um, long hours <laughs> and cross-referencing. I mean, there, you know, we get stuff wrong. And one of the things that I find weird about TV is that there is not a, uh, there's not a history of on-air corrections for factual misstatements on television, which I don't understand. Like, it's, 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 a, it's a, like, cause for a, a, a giant ripple of excitement whenever we do a correction on the air. But if we get something wrong, I try to correct it. Um, for the record, I call John Poindexter a uh, Marine in the book. He's a Navy Admiral. I'm very sorry. I mean, mistakes happen. There are, there are things that get screwed up, but you have to, I think it's like in your, in your academic work, you have to do everything you can possibly do to make sure you know what you are talking about before you say anything at all. Read first, talk later. Um, you have to have somebody with fresh eyes checking your work and then somebody checking their work, and you have to be willing to be wrong. Um, you have to be willing to make it right when you are caught out for something that's wrong, especially if you catch it out yourself and nobody else nails you for it. So it's, it's a spectrum and a process, as they say. There's no, um, there's no magic bullet. You just have to work really hard at it and care about it. Thank you. Okay, go ahead over here. Um, congratulations on the Steinbeck Award. By oh, the way. thank you. Um, in your interview there, you were talking about how the Republicans are willing to lose battles in order to win the war. Um, and you just said that this is sort of a door to be pushed on. Um, do you think that that's a good way for liberals to bring the discussion back to the center and perhaps move in a more progressive fashion um, to open that door of conversation? And what do you think are some steps that we can take to bring the country back toward the left? It's, um, it's a good question, and I don't think I know the answer to it. I mean, the basic problem in left versus right politics is that, uh, and you know this, I can tell in the premise of, it's implicit in the premise of your question, but basically my idea is that on the right, you've got the conservative movement, which is well-funded, well-organized, thinking generationally, knows exactly where it's going and knows exactly how it's going to get there and has almost infinite resources to do it. And then you've got the Republican Party, which is kind of not that awesome. <laughs> it just, I mean, not like, I don't, I don't mean Republicans aren't that awesome. I mean, like, the Republican Party is not a very good organization. Um, they're not very good at what they do. Um, they're not as good at what they do, actually, as the Democratic Party is. But they're... No, I, I don't... I don't, I don't if you are applauding because you're a Democrat and you like, you like the compliment, okay. But what I don't... I don't mean Democrats good, Republicans bad. I mean Democrats good at running a political party, Republicans bad at running a political party. It doesn't, they're, they're not good at the basic stuff you need to do in order to be organized, but they don't need to be because there's the conservative movement. And so they just hook themselves onto the conservative movement and they do what they're told. And if it sometimes means they have to lose elections in the short run because they are advocating against contraception or something in 2012, um, <laughs> the conservative movement doesn't care about the Republican short-term electoral interests because they've got their eyes on generational change. And so because of that, that's why, that's why you get this phenomenon on the right that you don't get on the left. Democratic politics have essentially been the same for most of my adult life. The policy positions have not changed, <clears throat> except they've skittered a little bit to the right, but they certainly haven't gotten more liberal and they haven't moved very much. Republican politics move so fast, so far to the right, that they're constantly turning on each other and having to reinvent themselves. I mean, John McCain and Sarah Palin ran on a cap-and-trade bail-out-the-banks platform. <laughs> in 2008, Sarah Palin. Right? I mean, Mitt Romney is, has to run against not only himself as a governor, Mitt Romney has to run against himself as the guy who ran in 2008. I mean, it's... They're constantly outpacing themselves, and that's because the conservative movement is 
making them, whoever's got the furthest right position in politics becomes the new standard bearer and they all scoot over. And then who's ever further to right from them, they all scoot over. And so when you do that, meanwhile, the Democrats are like standing over here. <laughs> so, but if these Democrats are standing here, we're kind of fighting amongst ourselves. Interest group. How much do we care about you? Is it okay that the Senate Majority Leader is anti, I don't know, I just, yeah. that's the Democrats. And Republicans are over here and they're like, <laughs> booking to the right. And as you do that, Democrats, whenever they have to compete in general election terms with the Republicans, are constantly scooching over here to try to be sort of centrist seeming. And that means that the center moves to the right. Which means that there are Republicans who fall off that rightward edge all the time. But it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter to the conservative movement in the long run. They don't care about short-term election cycle politics. In 2012, they're going to lose all those Midwest governorships that they won in 2010 because they got the guys, those guys in in 2010 and then had them run like they were running Alabama. Wisconsin is not Alabama. They're going to lose that. And that dynamic doesn't exist on the left. There's nobody who's pulling the Democratic Party to the left. So. How do progressives pull the Democratic Party to the left? Discuss. <laughs> okay, we're, okay, we're gonna do three more questions. Okay. You have to, okay, go ahead. Uh, thank you for the work that you do, logging those long hours to increase the amount of uh, useful information that we have to work with. <laughs> thank you. Um, in large part through um, what I've learned uh, from your show, I've begun to realize that we do have a shadow army um, of private contractors who uh, do, um, who, who fight, you know, in our name, if not under our banner per se. And I'm wondering who has the leverage to dial down those forces um, when that becomes, you know, I think, uh, a, before it becomes a point of crisis. Um, it's, this is one of these things that I think is doable. And you will hear in Washington that it's completely undoable. Remember back in the 2008 Democratic primary, um, both Senator Clinton and Senator Obama uh, were very outspoken against the use of contractors for what used to be military purposes. They both said that they were going to dial those things way back, that there was no reason we needed to use contractors for things that the military used to do for themselves. It was not saving us money. It was costing us in terms of our accountability in the world. And it was causing all sorts of problems. They were doing all sorts of bad things that then our soldiers had to answer for in a way that wasn't safe, even just for our military. They both sort of said, in my opinion, all the right things. And now as Secretary of State, the State Department has a huge number of contractors, and as President, in charge of everything, the, number, the contractor issue has not gotten any better. So what they say in Washington is that, ah, the contractors are just too integral to what we do. We, if we killed all the contractors, proverbially killed all the contractors, we got rid of all the contracts. Um, in the short term, we couldn't do anything tomorrow. And maybe it feels that way. I'm sure the contractors have made themselves seem indispensable. But the reason I write about it a lot, and in some sort of disturbing detail about what happened in the Balkans in the book, um, is to remind everybody that it hasn't been that long that we have had Halliburton and DynCorp and all these groups peeling potatoes. It has not been that long, and we were fine as a military power before we had that happen. There's always been some involvement of private businesses uh, and indeed profiteering in war making. But the outsourcing of the basic logistics of being at war, things like laundry, food, building barracks, driving convoys, VIP security, that kind of stuff, that was a purely military function really not that long ago at all. And so if it could be created in 20 years, it can be gotten rid of too. We can go back to the way it was. And where it came from is kind of a funny story. Um, and I think it's chapter four. Um, but thank you. I, I, it, it, it could be done and it takes will. And actually there have been some, it's one of those things where there's been some interesting cross, cross the aisle leadership on it. Claire McCaskill is a relatively conservative Democratic senator. She's conservative on some things, she's progressive on others. But um, one, she is, she is, if she gets reelected in Missouri, I expect her to be the one who holds the banner highest for doing that in defense. Thanks. Okay. On the balcony. Uh, good evening, Rachel. I've been, um, I've been watching your show since the 2008 electoral season, so it's an honor to finally uh, see you speak in person. Thank you. Um, my question relates to the uh, U.S. involvement in the recent crisis in Libya, 
where the U.S., working with NATO and the Libyan rebels themselves, was able to successfully oust uh, Muammar Gaddafi from power without laying a single uh, U.S. boot on the ground, so to speak. Do you see this kind of involvement working with uh, inter intergovernmental organizations and focusing on uh, less uh, manpower and less financial burden as a viable kind of path forward for the United States in, uh, in alternatives to long, costly wars like Afghanistan and Iraq? Um, I, there is no Maddo doctrine. <laughs> I, there's this really, really smart guy, uh, national security reporter, this young, this guy who I think of is like my kid buddy. He's like a, my punk rocker friend, Spencer. Um, Spencer Ackerman, he writes for Wired.com, writes for Danger Room, and I didn't, I didn't interview with him about the book, in which he was super harsh on the book, and it was this really confrontational interview, uh, which is exactly what I expected from him. It's why I love him. But he was like, what I'm surprised by is there's no Maddo doctrine of how we should go to war and how we should get out of war. And boy, howdy, do I, am I not qualified to do that, to be that. I, I think that it is worth um, really in a non ad hominem in a substantive, nonpartisan way engaging with what is essentially Barack Obama's way of waging war in the world. And he is a multilateralist for some things. He is happy to wage secret war in a greatly expanded way all over the world in a way that he does not have to answer for because it's secret. That's the beauty of it for politicians. But when it comes to interventions that are not secret, that are overt, he is absolutely a multilateralist, and that was typified by what happened in Libya. And I mean, that is a form of American, that is a form of exerting American power using the fact that we have a military that we spend as much money on as the rest of the world's militaries combined um, to advance international interest and foster international cooperation on national security matters. We would not have gone to Libya had the Arab League not said, go to Libya. And so, and similarly, with the Arab League not saying, I mean, with the, with the Arab League in a very different situation on Syria, I think that's part of the reason that they've taken a very different approach to Syria. So you are constrained by the fact that you are checking in with everybody else who you see as being on the same side of you on an issue. You can, in a sense, intervene less. On the other hand, maybe you can intervene more because if you've got an international coalition, everything looks, uh, everything looks legit. It's much more George H.W. Bush than it is any other modern president. So. I don't, I mean, I think, that's, I think that's Obama's way. I don't know that I'm qualified to, to weigh in on whether it's right or wrong, but it's a very, very different approach than what, for example, Mitt Romney is offering. Thank you. Okay, in the middle, go ahead. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you, Rachel, for everything you do. Um, I think if there were more Rachel Maddows, the country would be a lot better off. <laughs> That's very nice of you to say. There are and, no uh, more Rachel Meadows. <laughs> um, and, and secondly, um, I've got a quick comment and a question. Can you just keep it to the question? Because we need to end in a few minutes. So brief question. Uh, okay. I'd like to say that I was drafted in 1968. Okay. I found an extremely valuable thing to happen in my life. I also found that my family and all my friends became extremely interested in the outcome of the Vietnam War the day I was drafted. The question I have is, money is behind war. And I want you, please, to say something about the corrosive influence of money in our campaigns. President Obama, I'm told, needs a billion dollars for his reelection. What's wrong with this picture. Thank you. Thank you. And this year, do we feel any differently about the idea that however many hundreds of billions of dollars are going to be spent on each side, that some hundreds of those billions will be spent uh, by money that we can trace to nowhere? And the front page of the Boston Globe today is about how the likely nominee on the Republican side, the super PAC that is supporting him, um, is distinguished by the fact that a lot of the donations to that PAC are listed as um, organizations, as corporate shells. And so even when people are willing to, even when people are forced by the few elections rules we've got left to disclose something about where a donation comes from, if you put it through a corporate shell, 
there's no way to trace it back to a human. I always wonder if that means there's no way to trace it back to a country either. Like, if China had a real preference between Barack Obama and Mitt Romney, do we really think that they wouldn't figure out a way to... I don't know. Um, that would be against the rules, they say. <laughs> yeah, if the FEC was in charge of enforcing speed limits, every American road would be an Audubon. Um, the um, corrosive power of money is as old as politics itself, but we have gone through in a series of four or five Supreme Court decisions that have gutted what was, what, what remained of American election law. Um, we are now in a Wild West period where not only are we looking at uh, mysterious funders um, in on, on, a, on a massive scale like we have never seen before. I mean, one person could write a $1 billion check and to fund somebody's campaign, right? And if, if we're amazed by the fact that Barack Obama needs to raise a billion dollars and they'll raise a billion dollars on the other side, what about the fact that somebody who wanted, I don't know, this year's Steve Forbes or this year's Ross Perot or this year's, I don't know, Eric Prince or somebody to be competitive, why not find one of America's billionaires Say you're one of these guys who's worth seven or eight billion dollars, writes a one billion dollar check. Okay, now it's a three-way race. Not by virtue of any campaign, but purely by the interest of one billionaire's interests. Huh. It didn't used to, yeah, we've always worried about money in politics. We never worried about it like this. So I think that um, we are in a position right now that's a very, very hard opportunity, a, a hard uh, environment for political reform because these, the corrosion here mostly came through Supreme Court decisions, and you don't appeal Supreme Court decisions, what you're talking about in order to fix this, I think, and I don't say this lightly, is probably a, an amendment to the American Constitution. Um, and that's a really big undertaking. So, you know, I, I think we are a long way off from fixing it. And as they continue to strike down state efforts to even regulate it at the state level, it's going to be hard to even set a good example around the country for, how the, for something that the nation might want to emulate. It's the thing that worries me the most in all of politics. Okay. Thank you. Two more? Sure. Okay. We keep adding questions. Two more brief, brief questions. Do you have a question? Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Brief. Hi. Um... <laughs> To what extent has the U.S. government changed its concept of what constitutes a threat? I know you go further back in your book than the global war on terrorism, but in, in announcing this, the Bush administration effectively waged war on a type of war, on a tactic propagated by you know, a scattered, covert enemy. And so I guess my question is, to what extent has the unmooring of the locus of a sustained military threat actually further enabled the unmooring of the military itself? It's, I see it more as a symptom than a cause, I think. I mean, what, well, I should say, I mean, remember it was the war on terrorism, and then it became the war on terror. So we went from it being a war on a tactic to being the war on a bad feeling, <laughs> right? Which was, can you get any more like, war on ew, <laughs> right? Like, so it was, but by, the, that, the vagueness of, the, uh, of what we were having a war on should have been a sign to us that there was something wrong. And I think was a sign that there was something wrong. I think people are creeped out that we have a Department of Homeland Security. Since when does America have a homeland? I mean, it's, right? It's creepy. It's a creepy word. Like, we don't think of ourselves that way. The same idea of a war on terror seems like a deliberately vague thing designed to encompass all sorts of things that wouldn't otherwise be justified if you didn't call them a war. But when you don't have to win the argument, your argument can suck. <laughs> when you don't have to engage in a rigorous debate that if you lose that debate, you will not get your way, your arguments can be flabby. And you can point at, I mean, the way that, the way that I write about the, oh, I won't go back into the founder stuff, but you, you can identify anything as being worthy of this war moniker that you give it, which can justify massive international expense. So I, I think that when a president can decide alone what it is that we are waging war on, when there is no price tag put on it, remember that, I mean, all the, the post 9-11 war funding was not factored into the budget. It was all emergency supplementals. 
Like, oh, look, every six months. Oh, the war's still on. Whoa, the war's still on. Whoa, it's like a fish going around a goldfish bowl. Look, a castle. Look, a castle. Look, a castle. <laughs> it's like, it's not, it's... The, the, when, when you do not have to explain yourself to the public because it's secret, when you do not have to win the debate in Congress because the debate doesn't happen in Congress, when you do not have to justify the funding because nobody knows how much it's costing, your arguments can be incredibly vague. And you can call anything worthy of war. You can pick out a transnational terrorist organization. You can pick a country that has no connection to terrorism and say that it does. When you don't have to have good debates, you don't have to have good arguments. And that's why I want us to have good debates. Thank you. Okay, last question. Hi, Rachel. Um, I think you used to be a customer of mine. When you were at Lincoln, Dylan's at the end of Broad Street was my shop for the whole time you were there. Wow. Two questions. Okay. I'm so nervous. You, know, you guys don't know what I was like then. You still owe us nine per... No. Were you a customer? Yes. And did you, like me, used to go in the Turf Tavern at lunchtime? Yes. Thank you very much. All right. <laughs> Exposed as a daytime drinker in my last question. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rachel Maddow. Thank you.